Welcome to Democratic Television, a program of the Santa Clara County Democratic Party that brings insights, perspectives, and attitudes of our always thoughtful Democratic guests. Today, our focus is on local government, and our guest is David Cohen. He is a member of the Berryessa School Board and a candidate for San Jose City Council in District 4. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Last time I was on Democratic TV 15 years ago was the different technical time. After the taping, I received a VHS tape of the recording, and uh, then I helped uh, set up the infrastructure to put these things online, and now here we are for the first Zoom chat version of DTV, so this is exciting. Well, I'm, I'm glad that to review this episode, you won't need to go digging out uh, any VHS players from your garage, so welcome back to the show after, after 15 years. Uh, so it's been an interesting 15 years, a lot of change uh, in technology. Uh, and I know that you're uh, engaged uh, in, the, in the tech sector. Is that what brought you to the area? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I came out to California 30 years ago uh, to, to attend graduate school at UC Berkeley, sort of because of just a love of California and the Bay Area, because I visited as, as a, uh, growing up and knew that this was a place I'd want to be when I was on my own. Um, and then I ended up in the South Bay because of all of the exciting opportunities in technology. and ended up with a you know, position at, at what was Novella Systems and is now LAM Research, working in high tech. Um, I'm now an engineering manager there after 20 years with the company, and it's been a, a, a great period of growth in, in the importance of, of technology, and you know, Silicon Valley is the center of all that innovation. It's been wonderful. Well, in, uh, in many ways, David, that's a very uh, classic California story and, and Bay Area story, as you, as you know, uh, as the tech world has brought a lot of us uh, into the area. And uh, one thing uh, I'm always interested in with those of uh, us who've gotten involved in public service from sort of non-traditional uh, uh, sectors, uh, what, what is it about your life or experience that you feel made you want to make space for your community involvement and your public service as an elected official? Yeah, you know, I just always have been doing uh, community service on the side, and I think that was a value instilled in me by my family growing up, how important it was to be part of the community and involved in the community. Um, I was a leader of an organization in college that was uh, focused on community service, and I was the chair for service for my last year, and that gave me the love of working on service. But also, um, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, sort of in the, um, the, the suburban area where many of the people in the government were living. So I went to school with families and the, who, um, with children of senators and people in, in the administration, um, people, even a Supreme Court justice and their children were in my class. Um, so I, I observed what was going on and always had a strong interest in making sure that we had our values um, that were being reflected in the people who were elected. So um, ever since I was old enough to vote, I also was volunteering for campaigns. and. Um, knew that I wanted to be involved in the community. And when I moved to San Jose, I immediately joined um, the San Jose Library Commission a couple years later, you know, after I moved here and uh, went on from there to the school board and always knew that, that working for the betterment of my neighborhoods and community was something I was going to continue to do as much as possible um, as long as I lived here. Well, I, uh, I want to come back to uh, the, uh, the school board and your service there in particular. But first, I want to ask you about your district, both your school board district and the district you're running for for city council, because my sense is that you have a strong connection and a strong sense of neighborhood and community. Uh, what can you tell viewers about you know, where you live and what you like about it and what you've learned about it in the years that you've lived there? Yeah, so I moved into District 4 22 years ago, been here uh, the entire time and I uh, love this part of San Jose. It's right near the hills, near, um, you know, convenient to transportation to get around the area, kind of centrally located between Oakland, uh, San Francisco, and San Jose. It's a nice place to raise a family. We have great scenery up here in the uh, East Hills um, and a very diverse community. And so I raised my kids here in Berryessa. They went to schools here. And one of the great things about living in this community are the, the is the variety of people who have moved into Berryessa area and District 4 to raise their family from all over the world. And uh, the experience that my kids have had, um, having friendships with people from, from every place uh, has, has really, I think, broadened their horizons and, and made it a great uh, experience for them. Um, and that's what I like, really like about District 4. Um, it, it's diversity 
uh, its beauty, um, and it's, you know, it, it's not just diverse in terms of people who live here, but in terms of the kinds of neighborhoods. We have Alviso on the north. It's the one, it's the only uh, shorefront in San Jose, um, and an important uh, environmental uh, area, important ecosystem that we have to preserve. Just south of there is our high tech capital in North San Jose, where a lot of the tech companies are headquartered and there's a lot of development going on. And then we have the neighborhoods here in Berryessa and it's just a really interesting uh, district. You, uh, you mentioned the, the Berryessa Hills and I imagine that we're, we're doing this show, it's the very first democratic television show done by, uh, by Zoom. And so thank you for being game to give this a try. Uh, I'm wondering, one of the things folks are experiencing during the quarantine period is uh, unusually clear air quality. Are you, are you getting some good views uh, from the Berryessa neighborhood? Yeah, when we come up into the hills, the view of, it's, it's much different than it used to be in terms of the views. We don't have that haze over the valley. It really is very clear and very easy to see all the way up to San Francisco um, from, from just around the corner from where I am right now. Um, and we can see the entire the entire valley, Santa Clara, all the way over to Moffett Field and down through downtown San Jose. It's it's beautiful. Wonderful. The other thing that's uh, been been pretty uh, nice too is the wildlife is coming out a lot more than it used to be too. So we see a lot of animals and birds and things here. And in, in yes, it's uh, it's beautiful. It's also something of a reminder of what might happen to the world if we don't uh, take care of it uh, well enough to for us to be able to continue to live here. The wildlife might just come back and reoccupy everything. <laughs> So uh, you mentioned uh, the appreciating the schools and the experience your children have had in the schools. Uh, many uh, school board members get involved in school board as a part of their experience of parents. Was that part of your story? Is that how you ended up getting active in the schools? No, actually, I, it started before I had, well, early on, I mean, before my kids were in the schools here, I was on the library commission. And be, as a result of that, I learned about the importance of educational opportunities for, for children. I advocated during the um, early that first recession during the dot-com bust, uh, when they were cutting uh, budgets in the city, I advocated for the library hours because I knew that children were coming to our libraries after school and it was an important resource for them. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a natural connection to, to begin to move into public service with the schools after I had my term on the library commission was coming to an end. I also was um, friends with uh, Canton Chu, who was on the school board here in Berryessa, and he told me that you know a couple of our other school board members were retiring from the board and there would be an opportunity. So that was when my daughter was three and my son was not yet born. Um, wow. I decided to run for the board. Um, wasn't even really thinking about you know the effect on my own family as much as just the ability to serve families and students here in the district. Well, even before this, uh, this coronavirus um, pandemic and COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I want to talk to, uh, specifically about that in a moment. But even before that period, my, I imagine that you, uh, you have some accomplishments that you'd like to highlight from your service on the school board or some challenges that you faced. Uh, what, what's been going on in Berryessa that you feel like you'd like to point to as things you have a sense of accomplishment about? Yeah, I'm really proud of a lot of things that we've done in the district since I've been on the board. One of my main focuses has been on uh, mental health of our students. When I first ran for the board, um, I was pushing for us to increase our counseling services so that our students had access to the care that they need beyond just educational, uh, beyond just academic. Um, we then went into the Great Recession, um, and you know, obviously there were a lot of cuts being made, but my focus was on making sure we were very strategic about those cuts and that we preserved key programs that may not come back if we didn't save them. So I'm very proud of the fact that as a district, we um, kept our class sizes at 24 and K to three the whole time, never increased those class sizes, that we preserved our music program all the way. So we had music in our district all the way down to third grade, which is unique in this county, I believe. And one of the reasons why our middle schools have such great music, uh, music classes, music programs. Um, and then as we were coming out of the recession, we did a really a good job of then adding back um, our mental health professionals to the schools. Not only did we increase our counselors um, at each school, but we've now uh, added social workers at every site so that families and students in need have a place to turn and have people who can work with them when they need it. And, and it's really been a, a great thing. In fact, it's extra important now that we have those resources in our schools because students are you know, undergoing some trauma and, and, and a lot of anxiety during times like this. So having those resources at our schools has been a really great thing for our students. And then we've worked really hard on facilities. Um, I uh, pushed our district to, 
to uh, implement solar. And we finally got solar about, I guess it was six years ago now. Um, we now have solar at each of our schools and we've modernized our schools and added flexible instruction spaces with modern um, learning techniques and the ability for students to do creative things in the classroom. And um, so our schools are in really good shape and our, our district has been performing very well, even under the limitations of, uh, of what kinds of funding we have as a district. You mentioned the diversity of your, your neighborhood. I imagine that uh, the school district faces some challenges and opportunities serving a diverse community as well. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, so we've also put a lot of effort into our English learner program. Um, we've been recognized statewide for the quality and success of our English learner program with several awards. And every year, 300 of our students are recognized for moving from English learner status to uh, fluency. Wow. Um, we have 60, over 60 languages spoken by families in our school district. So being able to reach them and speak with them is important. So, you know, we have issues of translation and and um, you know things that are happening throughout this county, but you know we've done a pretty good job of working with that diverse group. We also have obviously families who struggle due to um, socioeconomic issues, and recently, of course, families who are worried about immigration status and how they're being treated by the government. And so our district was was the first one in Northern California um, because I wrote a resolution. Um, we were the first district to make to declare that we were not would not. Um, be a place that would cooperate and turn students in and we would we would be a safe place for all of our students to be able to get an education um, and that we would be make sure that all students were welcome in our schools. Uh, David, your, your uh, district I think has done well uh, in terms of perceptions for transitioning to this time of quarantine. What, what are the couple of things that you uh, feel the district really hit it out of the park on and are there any things you're still working on getting better at? Yeah, I mean, I, I would never characterize as hitting out of the park in a time like this. I mean, our district was very serious from the beginning of making sure we offered something for all of our students. And it was one of my priorities when, when the pandemic hit was to make sure that we didn't just, um, you know, that we weren't too slow about beginning to offer communication from our schools to our students and provide them with academic challenges and resources. And um, I think our district did a good job, and I, I'm very proud of the teachers and how hard they've worked to find new ways of reaching their students and be creative and spend time, um, you know, talking with their classes. Um, they have different means of doing so through, through different technologies, but all of our students are getting some kind of contact from their schools. Um, we are reaching out to students who are not as engaged in the classrooms. Um, our district, from the very beginning, of course, like most others, began providing food service for families who needed resources and help during this time. So we've been distributing about 1,200 meals a day to uh, families who come through and collect their meals. Um, we also uh, put together a process to make sure that all families who needed them got um, computers at home. And we have now purchased uh, hotspots to make so that we can provide Wi-Fi to the about 300 families that didn't have Wi-Fi in their homes. Fabulous. So we're working on all those things, but it, it's a work in progress. And, you know, I just want to make sure that we um, offer more than just um, online instruction, that we provide service for all of the students' needs. Well, thank you, uh, David, for our conversation so far. Uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, I'd like to talk a little bit more about your experience on the school board, but we want to leave enough time to talk about the city as well, because I know you've got a lot of ideas there. Uh, so uh, thank you for our conversation so far. We'll be back in just a moment. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name's Raul Perales. I'm a city council representative in District 3 in the city of San Jose. I'm a proud Democrat here in Santa Clara County and a happy former member of the Silicon Valley Young Democrats. And in fact, myself, I'll be looking for a new Democratic club, so I might be reaching out to our Democratic Party pretty soon. And if you'd like to get involved with your local Democratic Party, you can call 408 445-9500 or visit on the web at www.sccdp.org. Welcome back uh, to the second half of our Democratic Television uh, first time ever via Zoom TV interview with San Jose City Council member uh, David Cohen. David, welcome back for the second half of our show. Thank you. Uh, you, you. You said council member, but candidate still. I hope to be a council okay. member next year. Well, That's good. Right. Yeah, Thanks so for... there's a slip that we can live with, right, David? Yes. Well, uh, we were talking about your school board experience, and I know that's been really important to you. You've been very active in it. And um, 
do you have some, uh, you've mentioned the, the Great Recession, and one of the things that policymakers, and this will apply both to your current situation as a school board member and also uh, to the city council role, uh, we're going to enter a new time. We've uh, had some good times. We've been able to accomplish some things on the school board. Uh, what kind of challenges will districts like Barry also be facing in the future? And, and what would you like uh, policymakers like the governor and the state legislator, le legislature to have in mind as they think about meeting the needs of students uh, moving forward? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that I've been frustrated by is sort of the, um, you know, the focus on opening schools, which has been talking mostly about distance learning. And distance learning is obviously going to have to be an important element of what's happening. But I think we also are going to have to think about ways to get students together. Students are missing that, that interpersonal interaction that they had with their colleagues, with their friends, with their teachers. And I think this is really important. We, interestingly, we got an email from a group of eighth graders who were so frustrated to miss the end of their school year that they emailed the board and said that they wanted to be able to restart eighth grade or have the last two months of eighth grade continued into, into the fall so that they, can, they could experience that important time. But they pointed out, even though we're learning now, we learn by talking to our peers in class. We learn by interacting with our teachers. They, they miss so much by not having that social interaction. So while we have to consider safety and we have to open schools safely, we do need to keep in mind that we can't deprive you know, too many, we can't go too long depriving students from those kinds of interactions in school. Um, and then you know, on the financial side, obviously, having to find creative new ways to do things while also cutting uh, budgets um, is almost impossible. And as the state superintendent said last week, if we're really going to open in the fall, we're going to have to have more money, not less money, because to implement social distancing, to provide uh, equipment and, and cleaning supplies for classrooms um, requires extra spending. Um, we have not been saving money during this period of time. It's actually cost us more to implement all the technology solutions we're implementing. So it's important for, um, for the state to be aware of that. Um, as they think about new models for education. Are the rules for school districts any uh, better now than they were for the Great Recession period in terms of giving districts any flexibility in, in, in funding? I remember the rules were sort of strict and it, it forced a lot of districts to make harsh cuts that they might have been able to avoid if they'd had more ability to, um, uh, you know, a bit, not ability to borrow, but ability to uh, make decisions later than they were expected to. Yeah, I think there's more flexibility. I mean, it depends on where the funding is coming from. For example, the federal aid money that's coming um, does have specific uh, purposes and has to be spent in that way. Um, and so some of the aid money that's coming that's meant to serve during the time of COVID-19 is specifically meant to pay for the expenses that we encountered as a result of the crisis. Um, but there, but we still have, we have a little bit more local flexibility. Um, with the local control funding formula. Um, you know, our district is in a tough place financially because we, you know, while we have a lot of underserved students, we have fewer than 50% or around 50% and states, school districts don't get more large amounts of more funding unless they have above 55% students mm -hmm. of high need. And so our district doesn't get some of the extra funding that other districts get. So, so there are basically pretty well burdened with the, meeting the needs of, of, of students, but not quite qualifying for extra bumps. Right. And, and exactly. funding. That's, that's a hard spot to be in. Yep. Let's talk about city council in the time that we have remaining. It's a, it's a big deal to run for city council in San Jose. It's a big decision. And uh, in your case, you made that decision before this whole coronavirus COVID thing happened. What were you thinking at the time? What made you feel like it was the right time to make this move and, and, and to run for city council? Yeah, so I mean, I, I love our district. I love the communities here. I've loved serving the people of, of Berryessa and, and the district. Um, I've lived in Berryessa for 22 years. I worked in North San Jose within the district for 15 years. And so I've had a lot of thoughts over the years about ways we can um, work better with our neighborhoods to improve the community. Um, I've worked on it, things like getting new parks built, and, uh, worked on safety issues in the community neighborhoods. Um, I worked with Canton Chu when he was on the council to get a new sidewalk built because I saw people walking in the street unsafely. And I realized that, you know, there's a lot of impact that we can have to improve the lives of our neighborhoods and our, and our um, neighbors. So I had considered running for the council seat when it opened up four or five years ago, but, you know, my kids were in an age where uh, being able to spend the time with them and, and continue to, to have the family life I had was more important. 
so I decided not to run. Um, but now I'm seeing that the community is frustrated. They're, they're not getting the responsiveness and service that they want from their current council member. Um, and that's what um, city government should be all about, is that local service. And so I am running to sort of bring that accountability, uh, that cooperation, that sense of, of uh, priority back to our council district. In addition to that, you know, we, we need a council member who will put the interests of working people first and, you know, has um, some independence and some knowledge of science and technology to help drive the capital of Silicon Valley into the next uh, decade. David, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective about what's changed, about what your priorities, uh, concerns, what opportunities you see as a council member in light of this whole coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic. Like it certainly highlighted a lot of differences. It put some different strains on community resources. Um, what are your thoughts a, a, about becoming a council member and asking voters to help you become a council member mm -hmm. in this current environment? Well, first, I'd point out that, you know, I was on a school board during the Great Recession, which was a really challenging time to lead schools, because we knew that what we were doing was hurting students and hurting our school's ability to do its job. Um, but I learned from that, that times like this can also lead to opportunity, that you, you know, if you are smart about making uh, cuts and, and saving money, that when you end up coming out of that time, you can strategically add uh, resources in places that will better serve uh, the needs of families, students, and the neighborhoods. And so we're at one of those times in San Jose now. Um, we need to not necessarily have a formula, right, about how to cut across the board or do everything evenly. We need to think about making sure that certain communities which need extra help continue to get that help and certain communities that uh, can make it through the recession um, will, you know, make it through before we begin to you know, be able to have the ability to spend. On the other hand, we also need to, um, the, this, this crisis has helped, uh, helped shine a focus on some of the big issues that we've had, homelessness, uh, lack of housing, environmental issues. These things should now even be more clear to us about that we have to deal with them. Um, you know, the city was really slow at building affordable housing. The city wasn't doing enough in my mind to build um, places for homeless people to live. Now people are starting to feel this sense of urgency and, and we need to, to um, you know, get moving in those areas and, and, and not slow down because we're in some financial difficulty. Um, we need to focus obviously on resources for, to get small businesses and local businesses back open. Um, so that's also gonna be important. Um, but you know, the big issues of, of our time and of our city, uh, again, housing, homelessness, transportation, infrastructure, uh, and, and the climate, we, we, are, we definitely need to make sure that we're thinking long-term and we're not going to lose sight of the need to focus on those issues. So we're gonna have to continue to invest in those areas um, while we're making it through this, this difficult time. David, a lot of those uh, vexing problems like homelessness and uh, housing, transportation, uh, there's a crossover uh, or an overlap of jurisdiction between the county government and the city government. And uh, as an outside observer, sometimes it seems that they are trying to pass the ball to each other or maybe not working as closely together. Now, I think that in this recent pandemic period, they seem to have been closely aligned and I think that the community has benefited from that. But what's your observation about that? What do you see your role as a council member would be um, in trying to tackle problems like uh, it's, it's frustrating to neighborhoods in, um, and, and to our, our residents here in the district when the response they get is that it's not my problem, it's not my jurisdiction. My feeling is that a council member should have a staff that is capable of, of working to facilitate uh, cooperation between jurisdictions to get things done. As a school board member, one of my, most, my, one of my proudest accomplishments actually is the formation of the Eastside Alliance. When I first joined the board, I realized that districts here in the east side were not working together, even though we all feed into the same high school district. And so I pushed to get those districts to join together. And the result was an east side alliance between eight districts that has actually improved educational outcomes. We should be thinking the same way as a city. We should have better alliances with our neighboring cities and with the county to solve problems and not uh, hold up our hands and say, we can't do it because there's too many jurisdictions involved. There have to be solutions that are cooperative and collaborative. Uh, David, uh, uh, thank you for that answer. 
some of our viewers are like us engaged in politics in different ways. And to be curious about what's your life as a candidate and as a person running and planning a campaign, how, what, what challenges are you thinking about? What opportunities are you seeing in this um, shelter in place period? Uh, a little bit of uncertainty. What do you see happening and, and how has it affected your, your place as a candidate and your role? As a well, candidate? I mean, the most frustrating, the, the, the biggest frustration I have is that you can't really be out in the community as much. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons I'm, I, I like being involved so much is going to community events, being at festivals, being at graduations, being at, you know, being able to go and, and meet one-on-one -on -one with constituents. And when that's not happening, it's very frustrating. It makes it much more difficult, mm -hmm. you know, to, to hear about their problems, to learn about um, what their needs are, to meet more people. And so I am, uh, you know, working on other ways to communicate and, and cooperate and, and um, get in touch with with people, um, but you know we, we have to adjust, and and it, it's it's you know be, nobody likes being uh, tied down. We want to be out and about. So I, I do find opportunities to serve, uh, to go and help with, with um, homeless food distributions, to go and help just uh, give supplies to our students when we can, and and be out as much as possible. But um, you know the most important thing is that everyone stays safe. Uh, David, uh, for those uh, who uh, will hope you'll be able to get out there into the community again soon, for viewers who would like to contact you and reach out to your campaign, what's the best way for folks to connect with you? Uh, my campaign website is electdavidcohen.com. You can sign up there to receive communication from the campaign, or you can also follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash electdavidcohen. So hope to see you all there. Very good. Thank you for sharing that, uh, that contact information. Are there any closing thoughts you'd like to share? Oh, I know. Just thank you very much for the time. I hope everyone stays safe and uh, appreciates the great work that our county is doing to try to flatten the curve here in Santa Clara County. Um, make sure to wear your mask and, uh, and um, we'll see you on the campaign trail. Wonderful. Well, thank you, David Cohen, for your time with us today and, and best of luck in uh, continuing your campaign in these unusual times. And again, I hope you'll be able to get out there in the community uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you for watching DTV. Uh, give us a call at 408-445-9500 or visit our website at www.sccdp.org. Help us to make a difference. We will see you on the campaign track.